Um, anyway, glad to be here. I was honored to ask uh, to do this, and I uh, honored to be asked to do it. And I got to say, I'm not an expert on this field, but I am, like I think pr probably everybody in this room, I'm a recruit. We have all been recruited in this giant experiment in which we're basically going to festoon our bodies with sensors that are going to basically let ourselves and the world know every move we make, every step we take. Uh, this is not a joke. I was just out at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, and as you may have noticed, there weren't a lot of huge breakthroughs. The next tablet or the next, the next big thing that's going to transform the digital world, there wasn't one. It was more of the same. But there was one overarching uh, subject that was just everywhere. In fact, we had a keynote speech by the CEO of Cisco which, in which this was all he talked about. The Internet of Things, or as he sometimes calls it, the Internet of Everything. You saw a huge array of products in, uh, of practically every sort where, where you had one common thread, and that is that these products had embedded in them a brain, some memory, and a communication systems for sharing whatever information they collected. And that is going to become the standard or one of the standard features of our lives, practically everything we use collecting data about how we use it. Now that's going to just change practically everything. And you know, we all have the paranoid fears about privacy and we should have them. It's a worrisome problem. But the wonder of being able to live in a world in which the stuff we we use learns more and more about us every time we use it. I got to say, I'm looking forward to it. You already have it, of course, with your phone on a very crude, primitive level, with it tracking your every move, letting you see the traffic that's going up and down the street based on how many other people are carrying the same kind of phone and are driving at 20 miles an hour on I-93 at, 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 at 4 in the afternoon. There are other things like RunKeeper, one of my favorite apps. You put it on your phone, you go jogging, it knows where you've been, how far you've gone. Uh, they try to tell you how many calories, but what does it know? <laughs> but the fact is that they're tracking your physical, at least to some extent, your physical state. And we're getting more and more granular with that, with devices that are attaching to our bodies now to measure our heart rate and, and to, to give us some physiological idea of what's going on with our bodies in, in, in the most, well, not right now the most granular ways, but we're getting there. And at least the possibility exists that we can start using this data to begin to understand the emotional states of people. Uh, I have a certain skepticism about how far we can go in that area, but we've got a bunch of people here who know a heck of a lot more about it than I do, and they're going to walk us through this and show us the potential for using our devices to figure out what's really going on inside our heads. So we're going to have uh, our three panelists here who, for some reason, aren't sitting up here. We, am I supposed to introduce you guys one at a time? If so, let me start doing it. Number one should be Matthew Goodwin, who's going to come up here and talk to us all about his research with autism and how he's using these sensors to try to get a feeling for what's really going on inside the heads of autistic kids. Mr. Goodwin, let her rip. Okay, so uh, I'm pleased to uh, share some of the work we've been doing, uh, myself and a number of different colleagues here at Northeastern and uh, around the country, both in academia and industry, uh, trying to develop better tools to understand and support um, emotion, affect, uh, stress, and arousal in individuals with autism. Um, for those who do not know anything about autism, which I would find surprising uh, in this day and age, it's really characterized by difficulties with social relatedness, and this can include both producing and perceiving uh, emotion, uh, affect, uh, thoughts, beliefs, desires. Uh, it's also difficulties with communication. So this can be either no language at all, or if individuals have language, they have a difficult time understanding when to take turns, when to pause, when to uh, proceed. It can also be a difficulty, what we call alexithymia, where you have internal states, but you have a very difficult time identifying them, putting a label on them, communicating them to somebody else, uh, and understanding those, those communications uh, in return. And then restricted and repetitive behavior, so sort of a, a more narrow uh, interaction with the world, tend to be preoccupied with certain activities uh, and excluding others. It's affecting one in 88 children. Um, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, has just undergone another revision. So these numbers uh, appear to be dropping some, but this is still a very significant um, portion of the population. We don't know what's causing it. We have no cure for it. It's clear that genes are involved, um, but genes are not enough. There are also things that must be happening in the environment. So this is suggesting epigenetics. 
What we do know is it costs about $3.2 million over the lifetime per individual. So in any given year in the US, that's $35 billion. So this is now becoming a uh, public health concern. And what I really uh, am interested in, what I've been focusing on, and what I'd like to share with you today is that most of the scientific literature, what we've come to know about autism, if you look at the participant demographics, the section in the paper that describes the sample that is being, uh, being researched, they tend to have high uh, cognitive ability, good verbal fluency, they're higher functioning. They can, they can self-regulate with our research paradigm, the prevailing research paradigm, which is laboratory-based. So what this means is they have enough self-regulatory abilities to go to a strange place with a strange person for an ill-defined period of time, do a task they've never done before, keep it together well enough that they can contribute their data. So uh, depending on whether you look at IQ or if you look at verbal ability, we could say that about 50% of the autistic population um, is too severely impacted to comply with that kind of methodology. These would be the more severely affected individuals. Which means that the individuals we understand the least and we need to support the most are not able to contribute their data to scientific inquiry. And so a lot of what I'm gonna to talk to you about today and I'm doing a lot of work in this area beyond what I can share today um, is trying to essentially take the laboratory to people instead of bring people into the laboratory. And Stephen uh, Antilli, who will go after, after me and someone that I have been collaborating with for years uh, is gonna give you some mobile versions um, that extend uh, the work that's, that's talked about here. But if we sort of conceptualize this, and Maggie did a nice sort of alluding to telemetry, um, telemetrics. So let's just say that we have video, we have audio, we have ambulatory, physiological, and physical activity sensors um, can enable us to get out into the world. We can ob observe people where they are. That, that reduces reactivity to measurement if you do this right. It, it means that we can increase compliance, we can see people who don't normally come into the lab. It also has this nice advantage that we can increase verisimilitude, ecological validity. We can see people where they actually, uh, the spaces that they inhabit, and all the various different kinds of uh, variables that impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. We can also now do very nice things with visualizing this data, which I'll be sharing with you. And to the extent that we can do data analysis in real time, we can trigger real-time feedback. So we can you know, the person that's wearing the technology, we can deliver information to them or we can broadcast information about that person to others in the surrounding environment to provide better support. And so what I want to focus on uh, in autism right now are the majority of those who are more severely impacted engage in high rates of challenging behavior. And these tend to be aggression towards other people, property destruction, self-injury, elopement, that's getting up and fleeing um, with very little notice or sort of wandering and dwelling and not returning, and tantrums. And when you look at meta-analyses um, that behavior analysts trying to understand what function might these behaviors serve. Is this about escape and avoidance? Is this about attracting attention? Is this about trying to recruit social support? 30% of those cases are inconclusive. Now, these are the kinds of behaviors that get you removed from typical education settings. These are kind of behaviors that get you taken out of your home when you um, go through puberty and you get stronger and a parent can't just contain you anymore with their arms. This makes it very difficult for you to make friends. I mean, you are going to, if you engage in these behaviors, you are less apt to make friends, stay in normalizing environments and have the opportunities that the rest of us have uh, in society who can better self-regulate. When we can't understand the function, I think there's sort of a default interpretation that this is just part of the psychopathology of autism or the psychopathology of intellectual impairment. Even worse, what some people say, well, this is oppositional or this is defiant behavior or this is totally motivated to escape an avoidance because, because individuals with autism or intellectual impairment really don't want to interact with us. And I'd like to give an al alternate view, um, and, and there are others who work in this area, but this idea um, that challenging behaviors, I mean, the way that we've traditionally looked at this is how do you manage the behavior once you've become aware of the behavior? These are sort of the consequent focused behavior analysts. There are also a number of people who are antecedent focused behavior analysts. So they're thinking, what are the contexts that produce the outcome of the behavior? And, and instead of trying to shape the behavior, let's see if we can shape the context. And so what I would like to put forth is that there are internal states that function as context, and there are well-known laws or relationships between people's performance and behavior. This includes cognition, this includes affect, this includes behavioral propensities, and arousal. And, and this is an idealized normal distribution, but basically what it's showing is there's an optimal level of arousal and performance. So if we have too little arousal, 
or we have too much arousal, we get a response decrement in our performance. Now, our, everybody in this room may have a slightly different distribution, right? It might not be a perfect distribution like this. I overcommit and do everything at the last minute. That stress is facilitating to me. My wife, if she does more than one thing at a time, has a total meltdown and can't function, right? So, so each of us are going to vary in this. Very quickly, um, these are these are governed, these are mediated um, by very old parts of our brain. This is really into the limbic system. Every mammal uh, has an amygdala, has a hippocampus, has a brain stem. And when we think about stress, and I'm not talking about you know, a cut or a burn or some, some direct stimuli to the body, but a perception. This starts with the, with the cortex. And, and what's important about this is what stresses me may not stress you and vice versa. It's all about how we perceive whether or not we're going to have to do something different than what we're doing in this current moment. And if we have to do that, then we rapidly engage our limbic system. So the amygdala, you think of this in simplistic terms as your novelty or threat detection. The hippocampus is a memory store for past salient events. So I perceive something to be challenging. Amygdala says, yes, I agree. Hipp I mean, the I in here is up for debate, and I won't address that. Uh, hippocampus is going to say, we did this before. It didn't go well. Be on alert. I don't know what this is. High likelihood it could be a problem. Let's be on alert. If that happens, we get rapid corticotropin releasing hormone, goes down to the brainstem, hits the adrenals. Now we're into the peripheral autonomic nervous system. And this is our, our sort of two systems. The sympathetic, which is on the right, is your um, fight or flight. You can think of this as activation, mobilization. This is the accelerator in a car. Parasympathetic is your rest and digest, your restorative. You can think of this as your break. And so when we perceive something as being stressful, we decide we're going to have to do something about it. What often happens is we're going to start mobilizing. So all the body organs that are in the middle there are going to start reacting so to prepare us to confront something or to flee something. As far as we know, this is perfectly intact in individuals with autism. Now, you have to remember that a lot of the folks that I'm dealing with can't tell me what stresses them. They can't tell me what they're feeling uh, in a current moment. And, and most of them have a reduced um, expressivity in, in the face. I, I can't easily make an inference about their internal state based on their facial or their, or their gestural presentation. So what's been interesting, uh, we found, is, is by looking at things like pupillary diameter changes, looking at people's respiration rate, looking at their heart rate, looking at their skin conductivity, um, we can start to, to essentially let their bodies tell us, based on our observation of what it, what's happening in the environment, what is happening with their behavior, and what are we seeing internally, to try to come up with some context, some understanding uh, about the behaviors that they might be engaging in and the corresponding affect or emotion uh, they might be experiencing. So what I'll focus on today is electrodermal activity. This is really our um, measure of sweat um, coming specifically uh, through eccrine sweat glands. This is controlled uh, by several areas of the brain that are very sensitive to things like cognition, stress, uh, affect, novelty, and arousal. Um, a few years ago at MIT, Roz Picard and her group uh, in affective computing, who I worked with, developed a sensor that enabled us to get these measures wirelessly off the wrist. You can imagine, uh, so I tried this for many years. I was going to do full psychophysiological measurement with more severely affected individuals with autism, which means take off your shirt, 12 lead ECG, um, diaphragmatic, uh, pneumatic, respiratory strain gauge belt for respiration, have your hand down, tape electrodes on two fingertips, pretend like this isn't happening, take a deep breath and relax, and I'm going to get these measures. It didn't work. I, everything I could, I couldn't make that work. Um, so this was part of the impetus of trying to think about how do we do this in an untethered, unobtrusive, non-stigmatizing and reliable way. And we've since um, done some validation studies where we compare this to you know, gold standard benchmark wired electrodes and, and we're very well correlated. Um, this data is being collected. It stores locally on the device. But if you're in range of Bluetooth, you can stream it in real time. So what's at the top there is my real-time electrodermal activity. What's uh, in the middle is my temperature in Fahrenheit. What's below that is three-axis accelerometry. So accelerometry is the easiest for you to see. I can manipulate that uh, easily. So you're seeing more kind of bursts of activity with the movement. EDA um, is going to be a little trickier for me because anybody who has psychology experience knows one of the most uh, reliable and valid anxiety-inducing conditions <laughs> is to give a talk to a bunch of strangers getting very little emotional feedback. Um, so thank you. I really <laughs> I appreciate that. 
I'm, yeah, so I'm going to switch it quickly because I don't want to reveal too much about myself. Um, so what I will show you is some work that we have been, been doing with, with individuals with autism who have cognitive uh, communicative challenges and engage in challenging behaviors. A place called the Center for Discovery and the Catskills. Very briefly, it's about a 2,000 acre farm and they uh, work with kids who are, have medical frailty and severe forms of autism, but they're out in the middle of nowhere. So they don't have a bunch of bright doctoral uh, and master's students to come and you pay them very little and they do great research sort of helping you uh, validate the efficacy of their approach and understanding the mechanism. So this seemed like a good candidate for technology. So we took one of their classrooms and we installed 10 cameras, two microphones, um, a cardiovascular and electrodermal activity sensor. They've been recording every day for the same six students for two years. And these students were pre-selected because they engage in very high rates of challenging behavior. And so I want to give you an example of some of you know, what these behaviors look like and then what the physiology is starting to tell us. So this is a student here and this is his teacher. And you'll see, and this is very typical, where it, it looks like, so his state appears to be calm when you first look at it, and then a behavior comes out of the blue that totally makes you reconceptualize what state that person might have been in. And the thing is, if you only are aware of the behavior once the behavior's occurred, there's really nothing you can do about it to manage that behavior, right? And so what we're really trying to get at, get after rather, is what are, what are contexts earlier in time that precede the behavior that might identify how we can intervene differently. Now, if you're a regular ed classroom, do this once, and I'm pretty sure you're gonna have a different experience in school, and you're probably gonna get sent in someplace. Now, these two have known each other for many years. Um, they have a good rapport with one another. There, there was no reason, as far as the external environment is, con is, is concerned, to, to think that that was gonna happen. And what you're seeing on the inside, or sorry, what you're seeing below is the electrodermal activity of the student. So when we started just before the video, he's kind of at his normal resting level. We saw an increase in his internal state. Then you saw a production of those two behaviors. If I speed this up, the teacher's gonna start re-engaging him um, because he seems like he's kind of better regulated again. And he's gonna go so far as to even do some manual hand-to-hand -hand correction. Um, just based on the little snippet I gave you, you could probably make a prediction. He has not returned down back to a baseline level, so there's still a high probability he's feeling dysregulated. Now, I don't see this as, as an aggressive behavior. I mean, it is in the sense that he's hitting this other person, but this, this could be fight or flight, right? This could be that he, who knows? He's got a migraine. He had a seizure the night before. He didn't sleep very well. He's got gastrointestinal issue. At the, he can't tell me any of this. And, and maybe instead of... Well, so the, what looks like calm behavior might be an attempt for him to try to regulate. The environment, though, is still impinging on him. He doesn't have a choice. Now this is about survival, and I'm going to do whatever I can to get demands away from me. Here's another situation. This is a young, uh, this is a student, 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 teacher, teacher, teacher. Here you're going to see a little fancier thing where we can do computer vision um, tracking of who the people are, and then we're trying to automatically detect behaviors of interest because I've got two years of video. It would take me two years to sit down and watch that video. So if we can build algorithms that can automatically detect when certain kinds of behaviors are occurring, um, I can more, much more efficiently now get those examples. That also gives me a timestamp. And once I have a timestamp, I can go back and look. So here's the behavior. I now have a timestamp, it was detected. Now I can look back in time and say what was happening internally, physiologically, that was leading up to that event. And if there was a change, one can then look back before that and say what proximally in the environment might have changed that arousal. And then even beyond that, what more distally may have happened in terms of somebody's medication change, a seizure, a sleep problem. So what you're seeing here, is, and what was happening in that video, is the student sitting across was, was doing these loud vocalizations. And the individual that you saw jumping up and down was putting his hands over his ears. He seemed to be, uh, that was an aversive thing for him. So he starts by pounding on the table, and the sound doesn't stop. He bites himself, sound doesn't stop. So now he's gonna escalate, and now he's jumping a foot and a half off the ground and slamming down into the seat. Now this looks like an aggressive psychopathological behavior. I would propose maybe this is a maladaptive stress response. So if he does this, everybody around you changes their behavior. He has control over when he's doing at what force. So there's, there's more sort of dose response and control that he has over this. Um, and it's effective. Essentially, everybody's gonna move away from him and he's gonna get taken out of the room. And, and he now, it, whatever was stressing him, um, I assume it's that other student, but even if, even if it's not, he's now been removed, right? So he's not, um, he doesn't have to have that experience anymore. So what I want to show you essentially is that cardiovascularly we don't really see a change until he's already engaged in that jumping up and down behavior. 
the electrodermal activity, we had uh, about three standard deviation increase two minutes prior to him engaging in that behavior. And we're seeing this replicating within individuals and across individuals in this classroom with pretty good regularity. So what we're working on now is how do we visualize, how do we do signal processing of that data um, and then do real-time feedback? So that, in, that individual um, mood ring, but a real one, right? Not just a temperature sensitive gel. If I knew something about your, your, your Xyz-Dodson curve and I know when you are getting too low or too high out of your optimal range, can I feed that information back to you or feed it back to others in the environment? So if we return to our situation of that kid with his head down, if he had some ambient display that is glowing red because he's three standard devi deviations over what he should be, that teacher would have interacted very differently with him. Right? You probably would have offered him a glass of water, given him a task that he has some mastery over, cued him to take a deep breath and relax. And then the question is, does that decrease the probability that he's going to engage in those challenging behaviors because it was, it was arousal regulated? We also record uh, teachers because we're looking, we weren't, we're interested in, in interpersonal um, physiology and, and co-regulation. We have a PhD program here in personal health informatics. Anybody likes this, come talk to us. A lot of people help with this. Thanks very much. <laughs>